Hi, everyone, and welcome to the MLOps Live webinar series, where we discuss how to bring data science into real business applications. My name is Sahar, and I'm the VP of Marketing at Iguazio. Before we get started, I'd like to invite you to join over 300 MLOps and data science practitioners on the MLOps Live community. That way, we can continue the conversation after the session. We'll drop the link in the chat box now. Today, we have a great session planned about automated model management for CPG trade effectiveness. We're delighted to have our partners and good friends from Treedence here with us to discuss this topic. We're pleased to have Pavan Nanjudaya, Head of Engineering at Treedence, Sagar Balan, VP CPG at Treedence, who both have vast experience with CPG companies and solutions like we'll be talking about today, and Yaron Khaviv, co-founder and CTO at Iguazio. Together, we'll be discussing why 59% of trade promotions globally fail, what the challenges are with maintaining large-scale TPM solutions, how operationalizing machine learning fits into this equation, the importance of model monitoring, especially where market shifts happen very quickly and accuracy is paramount, why feature engineering is a critical piece of the MLOps puzzle, what feature stores are and how they can accelerate the path to production. And finally, how to enable real-time streaming and the unification of data from multiple sources. Today's session will include a real customer use case and a live demo. During the session, we'll also run two short polls, as always, to hear about your experience. So please do fill those in. These polls help us make these sessions more valuable for you. And we'll share the results with everyone at the end. Feel free to ask us questions in the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen, and we'll do our best to address them all, either during or at the end of the presentation. We've now put everyone on mute, and we're recording the session so that we can send it to you afterwards. And I will now pass it over to Sagar to get us started. Hey, thank you, Sahar. Uh, pleasure to be here and talking to the audience about uh, CPG trade effectiveness. <clears throat> It is an active area of conversation for the past uh, 20 or 30 years in CPG companies. I mean, trade has been a big area of spend. Every company, at least the top 25 CPG companies spend close to you know, 20% of their budget on, 20% of their revenue on trade spend. And trade undoubtedly is one of the big levers to move the top line, right? And if you can go through any of the Cagney reports, any of the annual reports, earnings releases, Trade is a lever which companies look forward to even when they're trying to take price on it, right? So let's look at a, you know, if you want to call it state of the union of trade promotion effectiveness. With all this money going into trade, is that really yielding the results? And this is uh, quite a rhetorical question. It's, you know, trade promotions are unprofitable globally. It's, it's, it's a known fact, you know, anyone in the CPG industry will in fact attest to the fact that, hey, if they're given us given a chance, we would perhaps not do trade promotions, but, you know, sell products on the basis of our brand, right? But that's, you know, that's rarely uh, the reality and trade is a necessary evil, if you may, right? So given that reality we live in, how can we help CPG companies be the best in that game, right? How, and why do those trade promotions programs fail today, right? And it's again, evolution. This is not a new problem. It's an old problem. Uh, it's been going on forever. But of course, what are the new challenges which are coming into the play, right? Uh, the market is changing at a very rapid place. Uh, the consumer tastes are changing very rapidly. Um, competition reacts very rapidly, right? There are new upstarts in CPG in every category which come up. And as a result of all these, right, trade promotion fails because if you're still using Excel, I mean, Excel is a great tool, but when the market around you is changing so rapidly, if you're basing your decision-making off the limited capabilities of Excel, it kind of struggles. And, you know, believe it or not, right, this still happens. Uh, we've been in CPG firms where still there are you know beautiful Excel tools which are being used and uh, they are failing. It, it's you know, it might sound like I'm, uh, you know, in, in a past uh, fossil world, but that's true. That still happens, right? 
And as a consequence, you know, there is a limited use of ML and AI to uh, apply intelligence to trade promotions, especially when you're talking about it at scale, right? When you're talking about, uh, you know, thousands of SKUs in, you know, 50 odd markets in which CPG companies operate, to do that at scale, you need uh, to use ML and AI, right? Uh, and Excel or even, you know, traditional SaaS-based regression models are not sufficient. As a result, what happens? It's the 80-20, the, you know, there are 20 top SKUs and 20 top countries, perhaps, which receive a lot of the attention and the others don't uh, get a lot of attention on how do you optimize trade, right? The insights are not timely. And, uh, you know, the results are that, you know, the trade promotion model, uh, the ROI of the trade promotion are not as good as the business wants it to be, right? So that brings us to the need of the R, right? Uh, CPG companies today, they want to be able to uh, do precision at scale. I think that's the new mantra. You can go to the, you know, biggest, you know, food and beverage players, you can go to personal care across CPG categories. How can you help them achieve precision at scale? And what do I mean by that, right? which is for a particular SKU in a particular zip code in a, you know, in a retailer, what is the right promotion, right? And to, do, to be able to do that kind of precision at scale, you know, globally, right? Because all of these CPG companies, you know, they operate globally, right? And that level of granular decision-making, the speed at which you can provide them that capability uh, is where the shift is happening. And why is all this possible today? is because you know you are able to do you know this kind of high compute high accurate precision compute on the cloud now that's a beautiful scenario uh, you know but what are the challenges it brings towards right when you uh, if you can move to the next slide sahar uh, as you think through this process of doing precision at scale there are you know three big challenges which come to play and you know that's what we're trying to talk about here Right. Uh, firstly, that means that you have to be able to create, monitor, and adapt over you know tens of thousands of machine learning models running in production scale IV environments. Right. Uh, we've broken that down into three big uh, value chains. We call it one is the creation value chain, the other is the monitoring value chain, and third is the business value chain. What's the creation value chain? Right the whole model creation process and then migrating it, you know, from dev to QA to prod, right? Uh, you know, anyone who's been in the CPG industry knows that, you know, compared to other industries, the use of, the heavy use of external data in CPG industries causes a big creation challenge, which is your data, which is coming in from your POS systems or a third party POS vendors, they uh, have a lot of data quality issues, right? You, you know, the product master sometimes doesn't ma match, uh, the promotion code sometimes doesn't match, or a particular column is missing, a huge amount of data challenges, right? How do you uh, detect those data challenges, you know, proactively? How do you prevent your production applications from going down, right? And if it goes down, how do you troubleshoot and, you know, increase the uptime of your you know, high scale, high precision trade promo application. So that's one challenge. The second challenge is monitoring, right? And monitoring has both a data angle to it as well as a business angle to it. The data angle to it, of course, is that, uh, you know, the data in addition to, you know, good quality data, the data also changes from what you planned. So let's say, you know, a particular company decided to do a certain promotion on a particular SKU in a particular retailer, say the competition launched a better promotion. Right, so your promotion is not doing as well as you planned. So the data is now going to drift in terms of the sales and the uplift. How are you going to track it? How are you going to alert your business that hey, the business is changing as a result of it. The data is changing as a result of it. The model accuracy is going to change. How fast can you act on it? Right, uh, that's what I mean by monitoring value chain. And you know the. You know, one of the other related drivers here is what is the business value chain, right? The shoppers are evolving, the competitors are evolving, the channel as well is evolving. Now, put together all of this, and you might think that you have an intractable problem. Well, that's that's what it seemed like maybe 24 months ago, but you know that's not the case anymore. Like we've done this in 
uh, in the real world for our CPG clients, you know, we are able to help them overcome the challenges of data drift, model drift, business drift, you know, thrive in that world and not be daunted by those challenges. Now I'll hand it over to Pawan, who will walk you through an example of how we actually did it. All right. Thank you, Sagar. Hello, everyone. Uh, Sahar, if you could move to the next slide, please. All right. So as Sagar was saying, uh, you know, there are a bunch of challenges that CPG customers are uh, facing uh, as a part of their forecasting models, trade promotion programs, um, et cetera. So for the next, uh, say, 10, 15 minutes, I'll take a specific use case and share some of our experiences as to uh, what was the real challenge with this customer's uh, implementation and how did we really create an impact and solve the um, real challenge um, at hand. And at uh, end of the day, we basically help them to improve the efficiency of their trade promotion program, right? So the context uh, is this. So this is a large uh, CPG client. Uh, the magnitude of their trade promotion program uh, was just massive. Uh, the global budget allocated was around 300 million uh, just on the trade promotion program. Uh, the number of models they were running in production was 66,000. That's a daunting number. And what we mean by a model here is uh, typically in a trade promotion program, you're running a bunch of uh, forecasting uh, models. Now, these forecasting models are running at an intersection. Uh, in this case, the intersection uh, happened to be at the granularity of uh, a skew, a distributor, a geography, so on and so forth. So you, you would see different uh, variants of this across different CPG uh, client implementations. But this was one of the bigger challenges that when a monthly forecasting uh, program runs, and when you are uh, talking about models in the range of 66,000, um, trying to even understand what's happening and then making sure that they're working as expected was a challenge in itself. Uh, this was a global program, so it was rolled out uh, across 13 countries. Uh, some of the challenges that the customer faced was that uh, in a monthly forecasting uh, uh, scheme, you will, uh, you're clearly time bound, right? You want the forecasting uh, jobs to complete within a given time so that you can hand over those insights to business and then the business team basically takes critical decisions based on those forecasting models. But then when a job fails, it's, it's a nightmare to debug because you wouldn't know uh, which job has failed, which model has failed, why it has failed. So on an average, we were seeing that about five days of down downtime was seen uh, in every monthly run. So these were some of the challenges or, or the context we had walking into this project. Um, uh, the solution that we built essentially uh, clearly added uh, value to the customer's business, but how we really did and what we really did is, is what I'm going to talk for the next five, 10 minutes. Um, on one side, uh, the MLOps solution that we built, uh, right from building the model to testing, deploying, and then monitoring this, uh, these models in production, uh, we were able to uh, efficiently manage 66,000 models. Uh, the production downtime, which used to be around four or five days, um, came down to six hours. Um, I'll follow this with a quick demo and I'll show you uh, what we really did to kind of bring down that uh, production downtime. Uh, we used our uh, drift libraries to understand the health of these models. Uh, now, a classic uh, problem that customers face in the CPG world is, say your model has done a prediction or it has forecasted a certain uh, dollar sales you wouldn't know till the end of that month, or at least till the time you get the ground truth as to how accurate was the prediction. And in a lot of cases, what happens is by the time you get that ground truth, by the time you get the actuals from the market, uh, it's a little too late because you've taken decisions, you've already started spending money on that prediction. Uh, and hence having something like a drift detection is extremely useful because in a proactive way, uh, you know, we were able to tell to what degree of confidence can you trust these numbers. Uh, and if you don't trust these numbers, here's what you can do is essentially what our drift library uh, helped this customer. Um, right off the bat, we were able to detect about 51% of the models have drifted. And what that 51% means is something that I'll explain in the following slides, right? Um, so our next slide, please. So here's an overview of what really happened behind the scenes. I'll start from the left and move to the right. Uh, uh, like in any other uh, uh, typical trade promotion program, we were dealing with data coming in from ERP systems and flat files. Uh, uh, once the data was extracted 
from the different source systems. Uh, in this case, the customer stack was Microsoft Azure, and hence we uh, built uh, uh, data engineering pipelines using um, Azure Data Factory. So the ingestion jobs were basically extracting data, doing the transformation, and staging it for us to build models on top of it. Uh, in the model management box, uh, you know, uh, we leveraged uh, uh, Azure ML services, MLflow, Databricks to basically build models. Uh, of course, uh, a bunch of uh, different experiments were run and in each run of the experiment, we were able to track what hyperparameters are making sense, what version of the training data is really working out well. And the best models were basically tested and then deployed. Now, when the model is running in production, when the model is running its forecasting job, so that's when in production, the drift detection uh, would kick in. Drift detection basically would tell us that how different is the uh, distribution of the data uh, in production compared to the time the model was trained uh, in a training instance. And based on the distribution difference, we were able to attribute a certain score uh, and quantify the drift that we've detected. Uh, the output, uh, be it the prediction output or the metadata that we are extracting as a part of monitoring this job or even the artifacts, essentially were stored in a storage layer. And then the insights started coming out, wherein uh, we would say that uh, the model has done a certain prediction in terms of the forecasting number. Uh, what's the drift uh, saying uh, regarding the health of this model? And if uh, by any chance, uh, if the pipeline fails in production, uh, the fact that we were monitoring these models uh, and we were able to extract metadata out of the monitoring process and create a visual provenance graph, uh, we were basically able to uh, not just help the data science teams and the business users, but also the support folks uh, to efficiently monitor these ML pipelines. Um, ultimately, the solution support of the last box, which is monitoring, um, here's where we uh, kind of ensured that the customer was back solving uh, real business problems uh, in their world while we were taking care of uh, monitoring these pipelines when they were running in production and managing these pipelines and meeting the required SLAs, right? So in a nutshell, this kind of uh, describes how our solution was created and uh, was managing the trade promotion program. I'll, I'll drill down on this drift detection part uh, one bit more just to give you all some perspective of what really happened behind the scenes. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, the, again, starting from left, I'll describe the process and tell you where the drift detection was injected. Uh, so think of a typical process, uh, which would start on the first of the month. Uh, so data has landed uh, in the staging area. We have extracted data from source, dump it in the staging area. And then the typical predictions would run around the fifth or sixth of every month. So we had this time window between say the first and fifth where the drift library would kick in. Uh, so initially to start off, uh, right? So we would basically uh, run the drift library on all the entire training data, testing data of all the mod models. And then we would uh, let the drift uh, library uh, uh, pump its output uh, in the form of actual drift scores. Uh, obviously when, when we start off on a project, uh, uh, the confidence level uh, probably will not be as high in the sense that the customer hasn't validated uh, the drift library and hence probably wouldn't trust uh, the scores a lot. And hence what really happens and what we've done in the past also is while we generate a drift score, we will use that as a uh, precursor and wait for the uh, entire forecasting to happen and for the actual data to come back. Essentially what then happens is we are able to generate the RMSE and MAPE scores, which gives us a difference of what is the prediction versus what was the actual data. Now we put two and two together and we are able to show to our customers that look in, in a proactive way in the first week of the month itself, the drift library has detected a certain drift and these drift scores are in line with what your RMSE and MAPE scores are saying. And hence there is merit in uh, you know, trusting the insights that we're giving. So with time, obviously uh, customers will get confidence and I'm kind of fast uh, forwarding the whole process just to, uh, give you all an overview of the real insights that the customer got. So uh, typically the first of every month, let's say the data has landed uh, and the drift libraries kick in. And then with time, what we've done with our customers is we've identified a few high value SKUs. These are SKUs which are uh, generating a lot of dollars for you and you really want to have the best insights on the forecasting for these numbers. 
So at least on, we start off by identifying these high value skews. And instead of just letting the forecasting run blindly on those, uh, uh, on those intersections based on a training uh, that was done say a few months back, we would pick those intersections which have drifted and we pass it through a retraining process. Now, what really happens in this retraining process is we are able to tweak the hyperparameter such that it has now seen the most recent data. It now has the most accurate hyperparameters. And by fourth or fifth of every month, when these models, the, when the retrain models come back, and when the scoring happens or when the forecasting happens on the fifth of every month on these retrained models, what comes out at the end of it is, is really golden because those are reliable insights that you can hand it over to your business. And hence, by sixth of every month, uh, when business looks into these forecasting numbers, with a lot of confidence, you can uh, share those numbers because uh, those numbers are more recent. They are uh, uh, predicted by models which are uh, fairly recently trained with the right hyperparameters. Right? So that's kind of, uh, in a nutshell, what we did uh, as a part of our drift process. And what we are showing in the bottom left corner is typically how we uh, work with our customers and give them that confidence that when we are saying that a certain intersection has drifted, it really means that there is a high drift. What we've shown there is a two by two. Uh, on the y-axis is the drift and on the x-axis is the RMSE. We typically focus on the first quadrant, which is a high drift, high RMSE intersection. Uh, because these are intersections where uh, we are for sure um, saying that we've detected a drift. Uh, the RMSE historical, uh, historically has also confirmed that yes, these uh, models uh, have got a high RMSE and hence it makes total sense for us to drill down on those intersections which fall in that first intersection and then um, uh, consider retraining. Of course, uh, which time uh, you will realize that retraining only will not help and you know we've come up with a bunch of other solutions but I'm just keeping it to retrain as one of the things that we've uh, tried. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, let me jump into a quick demo. Uh, what I want to show you all is uh, a demo of, uh, from our uh, internal instance here, uh, just to give you a sense of uh, uh, what is the kind of insights that we deliver and what would uh, this drift really look like and how did we improve the monitoring uh, for customers. Um, of course, this is uh, one of our uh, um, internal sales demo instances. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, the data is basically uh, sales ready data, but I would uh, urge you all to focus on the functionality that I'm trying to show. So think of this as a cockpit view, that is a bunch of models are running. So think of this in, in this case, let's say 66,000 models are running. You would want to know uh, which models require your attention, which models are working fine, which pipelines are not working fine. Right? So I'll just drill down on one such um, use case. Uh, individually think of these as different intersections and there's a model running at, at the end of each intersection. Uh, I'll just focus on drift for this webinar. Say for each intersection, we are able to quantify a certain drift percentage. So when I click on the drift percentage, uh, I'm putting on my data scientist hat right now. Uh, so if I'm a data scientist and I've, I've got a solution like this, which is calling out that, look, these models have drifted. And let's say this happens to be one of the uh, very high value skew, you really would want to understand first, how did you come up with this number 19.85 and what am I supposed to do, right? So essentially what we are saying is there is an overall drift for on the model, uh, which is running at this intersection of a particular region, retailer and a skew. Uh, we also have a drift trend, which basically with time, we can track how has the drift uh, been on this intersection where you will see that the orange line is going up and down. We also have a configurable alert. Typically what that means is if you feel that uh, if an intersection has drifted uh, or is showing you a constant drift of let's say 5% as a threshold, we can trigger alerts, email alerts, which basically sends you a note saying, hey, I know you've got 66,000 models in this case. Humanly, it's not possible for you to track all of them, but these are high value skews and looks like these have drifted. It calls for your attention, right? So that's the kind of insight we want to give. Uh, coming back to the 19.85, let me drill down on that and give you a, a flavor of how did we even come up with that number? So behind the scenes, what's happening is uh, the model is uh, exposed to a certain production data on which it's uh, doing its scoring. The model was trained on a certain training data. So the drift library basically compares the distribution difference between these two data sets for this model and is able to quantify saying, 
these are the features that are used in these models. And here's how at an individual feature level, there's a certain drift. And cumulatively, when we aggregate all the drift at a feature level, that's what uh, basically aggregates to a larger number. I'll just take one feature just to explain uh, what you're seeing on the screen. So uh, imagine this particular forecasting model has got four external regressors, like uh, promo duration, promo spend, et cetera, et cetera. We are saying that one of the feature, which is the promo duration, has got a fairly higher drift, and hence the bar is slightly taller. Right? If you look at the distribution here, so this model was trained. So these blue dots are the distribution of the data in your training set. This yellow dot is essentially your production data. So internally, what the algorithm does is it looks at the distribution difference between the training and testing and is able to uh, then attribute a score saying that it looks like the model in this case was exposed to a certain uh, production data. It's a single point prediction here because we're running it for a given month. And the distribution difference of this point with respect to the other nearing neighbors from the training set is fairly high because of which we believe that this model has drifted the most. Similar logic is applied to all other features. And then we are able to aggregate that into one large number, which is the overall drift, right? Th that kind of gives you some perspective of how um, a drift score is attributed. Let me get back here. I also want to show you all quickly, um, how did we bring down that uh, production downtime from a few days to a few hours? Uh, what we have here is, um, is what we call as a provenance graph. Uh, as a part of monitoring different pipelines, we are extracting metadata from each step. And with that extracted metadata, we are able to reconstruct a visual provenance graph. This basically says that uh, step one done, step two done, step three done. Oh, by the way, step four has failed. Now, in a scenario where a complex ML pipeline fails, if somebody can tell you that it's failed exactly on step number four, that's a, a, a lot of time saved right there. Now, a lot of times customers are using standard uh, orchestration tools like let's say an Azure data factory or an Airflow where they themselves give you some kind of a tracking. This provenance graph is especially useful when you're tracking, let's say a notebook code. Think of a scenario where you have a notebook code with let's say 10,000 lines of code and then that notebook fails. It's a nightmare to debug what happened, which part of the notebook has failed and how do you even recover from there? Having something like a provenance graph, which basically modularizes your code and tells you that this section of the notebook has failed and clicking on this takes you to the notebook at that particular place where it has failed, saves immense amounts of time and kind of helps you in uh, uh, the root cause analysis, uh, you know, way faster than um, what usually happens in a production uh, support scenario. So using, uh, uh, you know, solutions like these, we were able to uh, bring in a lot of value add for our uh, customers. So some final thoughts, um, we've obviously implemented this across customers, uh, uh, you know, uh, special lessons learned uh, from our CPG trade promotion implementations. And uh, we thought we'll just put some of our uh, thoughts together. Uh, some of the lessons learned essentially are, um, MLOps is, is, is kind of becoming mandatory these days, right? And the reason why I say that is, uh, in scenarios where you've got business critical decisions that are being taken based on the forecasting numbers that are coming out of these models, we better take good care of these models because there's a certain rigor that is required to build these models, test these models, put them in production. And I would say the real fun starts once it goes to production because it's not magically going to work well uh, for the rest of its life, right? So you'll have to constantly monitor that, understand what's happening. And that's why delivering accurate model predictions will actually take some time because the first day you put your model in produ uh, production, you probably tested it on, on decent data in your uh, pre-prod instance, and you're fairly confident that the model should work fine. But a lot of times what happens is with time, the data drifts, with time, a lot of times there's a concept drift happening. And hence, uh, you'll have to constantly monitor these models. And hence, uh, with time, uh, you, you will, we will, at least in our experience, we've figured out that there are n number of reasons why the accuracy would drop. And hence, um, it takes time to get that level of maturity. Monitoring, obviously, especially if you're dealing with uh, the problem of scale, in this case, like few thousands of models, monitoring the production models is extremely difficult. Uh, because a lot of times what happens is uh, production support teams may not be very well qualified to handle complex data science problems. And the last thing you want is for those guys to call up the data scientist who built the code to come and debug the production issue. 
because that's absolutely not the right use of the data scientist time to sit and monitor production job right so those are some real challenges that we've seen in our prior implementations um, the last lesson uh, that i want to cover here and a big lesson that we've learned in our implementations is uh, a lot of times we when a model has to be built you know you would think that uh, um, a regular scikit based python model running on a single node is good enough and then you put it in production uh, customers start seeing value and then they probably start expanding this to other geographies other products queues etc and then very soon you will realize that your model was never built for scale because your data volumes are increasing the the customer base that you're serving has started increasing and then it becomes a little too late to go and retrofit right you probably haven't uh, thought uh, about the right compute clusters that should be associated with these pro uh, with these models it probably wasn't uh, right to even start off by thinking a single node uh, cluster would work for you right it probably needs a different horizontal scaling as an architectural uh, change so some of the uh, lessons that we've learned are um, we should definitely think for scale uh, right from the get go only then can models really be scaled in production and meet the timelines and the criticality that customers these days are expecting right so that's uh, about it from my side thank you sir over to you so now i'd like to pass it over to yohan yohan please uh, so thanks uh, sar and, and thank you the treatment team uh, for talking to us about sort of this um, very real problem so uh, let's let's now talk about we know we, sp we spoke about the business challenges and how uh, it was solved in this specific uh, project that uh, was shown here but let's uh, let's understand sort of the mlops challenges and how we can essentially try and create more operationalized uh, pipeline that allows us to to solve the problem in a more automated fashion and with less uh, overhead and less uh, resources. So <clears throat> some of the key challenges for the productizing models are around those four segments and they were discussed in the previous uh, section. Part of it is siloed work. We have DevOps teams, data science team, data engineering teams and, and all and they usually work with different set of tools. Uh, the second is that it's a very long uh, process uh, taking data from all those uh, different sources, you know, whether these are advertisers or uh, merchants or uh, retailers and so on, and bringing all that uh, data together, then crunching it and, and aggregating and, and, and building the, the data for training and then running the training and creating the models. And as you've heard, it can be thousands of models, then serving those models and so on. It's a very, very long process, not to mention the sort of the legal issues and governance and drift detection and so on. Um, one of the, the key problems is also access to data because the data arrives from many different uh, sources, not necessarily even from the same companies that we, as we've seen here. Um, you know, some of it may be in the store, some of it may come from, from a, a partner, some of it may come from a mobile app of, uh, of you know, sort of loyalty programs and, and some other uh, problems. And we need to try and dissect all that problem, all that data. So we may have gotten access to that data for training. We've made some extractions of CSV files from different sources, but as we go into production, how do we access all those operational data sets uh, that come from different companies and bring them all into the single uh, model? And we also talked about the model accuracy as being a, a major problem, especially around seasonality uh, or different Phenomena like you know uh, something like COVID that arrives, or maybe some um, some other things that may impact immediately the the buying patterns of, of customers. Uh, next, but essentially in, in all those challenges, there is one core big challenge: is how do you bring uh, this data that comes again from all these desperate disparate uh, resources? Some of it is is online data from operational databases. Some of it is, is data arriving from applications. Some of it is data arriving from uh, you know, social uh, networks. Uh, and we need to take all that data and turn it into features. Those features are sort of aggregations and something more meaningful about the data, um, you know, data that we join across different uh, data sets, that data that we encode, uh, you know, we, we get a zip code maybe Based on that zip code, we know the social, economical, you know, situation in that neighborhood. You know, if those guys are buying more or less, and, and so on. So we need to feature engineer and then create those features. And those features are going to feed three different uh, applications. 
So on one end, they're gonna feed the training. So we're gonna create a training set, and run some training and create the models. But then the same type of features that arrive from the production data and from online data need to, to also be used for serving, for scoring. So we get we we have to build those feature vectors, compare them, you know, we transfer them to the serving, to the models, and get the response. And based on that response, take a decision, whether it's changing the inventory levels or uh, or do something else. But also there is this third application uh, that uh, we just heard about. When you want to model the model uh, performance or the model behavior, we have to you know, uh, collect all sorts of statistical information about the data in production, same statistical information about the data in, uh, in training. And based on that, do comparison, do all, you know, real-time comparison to understand that you have a skew in the data or the results. And this is essentially identifying the drift. So we need to, to build those, this pipeline that allows us to feed data into those three different applications. Uh, next. So traditionally, the way that we build that data is using three different implementations, three different pipelines. So we have the sort of offline pipeline or the research pipeline, where we take all that data from all those operational sources, we dump it into a data lake, and then in that data lake, we're starting to do transformations and queries, and we build the data for the training and then run the training on top of that data. As we go into production, we need to build exactly the same stuff, just this time with online sources, you know, operational databases, customer transactions, logs, activities on the applications, uh, Nielsen, and so on. So we need to bring all, that, all of that data and transform it uh, immediately, not necessarily throw it into a data lake and build an application or serve a model based on that. And finally, we also have a third pipeline, which is analyzing the results of the model serving and being able to analyze the drift and also potentially do other things like explain the model behavior over time and so on. So we have three different pipelines that is, are managed by different disciplines, the ML ops, the ML engineers, the data engineers, and so on. And next. And as we mentioned, it creates a lot of problems, including accuracy problems. If we make, you know, we can monitor the accuracy all day long, but if we have separate pipelines that produce different features in the online side and in the offline side, we won't get accurate models. Uh, we will have drift across those, uh, those models because they're not trained and tested uh, and served on the same data. Uh, next. So essentially the project we've, we've taken and, and also the open source project that we've uh, developed and, and endorsed around AML Run is, is taking a different approach of essentially starting with the data as a central of the universe. So the feature stories, this is the place where you store those features, you produce them using automated pipelines that can run online or offline or real time or batch. Uh, those transformations are generating those computed features and the computer computed features are stored in two different variations. One which is really more real-time access or online access for the serving or for the monitoring aspects. And the second is sort of more, you know, query oriented sequential batch for things like training and analysis or data exploration. So then you have the feature store, but also you have those serverless functions that can do the training, can do the serving, can do the model monitoring analysis and so on. So then everything is glueless and it's very easy to build all those different uh, pipelines. And now all those different disciplines can run across and use the same system. One guy will develop features, another guy will consume the features, third guy will bring it to production and so on. Uh, next. So, you know, just this process of how do you develop features? So usually you, you start off by creating a pipeline of, you know, transforming raw data that may come from, again, operational data sources, um, like logs or, uh, or you know, your Oracle database or some transactions coming from, uh, from stores and so on. So you can build a pipeline that says, you know, take that data, run those transformations, aggregate, join, you know, group, uh, clean the data, do one out encoding and so on. So build those features that will eventually land into the feature store. And once it's in the feature store, it also stores the statistical information, which later on will be used for things like drift analysis. 
and, and also other information, like it creates a catalog that we can take from that catalog and build new applications. So one of the critical problems is that you may want to build a new, a new application, whether it's creating some recommendations, smarter recommendation, or, or maybe building some loyalty program, or, uh, or maybe do some interactions on the social with your customers. So you want to build a new, a new type of product, which requires a new model but you already have all those features from a different program. So if you put all those features in sort of a catalog and you can search them and you can just you know, tap and, and build a feature vector for your new model, uh, just by clicking a few buttons, that uh, helps enormously. Uh, and the last aspect is the integration with the different frameworks, with the training frameworks, with the serving frameworks and, and with the governance framework. So reading a data set from a feature store is a single API call and then you just feed it into your training uh, service or same for, for serving. You can just go to the feature store, uh, fetch a feature vector based on some key, like a user cookie or user identity, get back the result, score, and do the action that you need to do. So this simplifies the overall process uh, quite a bit. Uh, next, just helping in the serving and helping in the training it has significant impact on the operational pipeline and the monitoring and drift analysis. So the, the feature store essentially provides the features and a few extra things like validation policy, data validation policies and so on into the model uh, serving layer above. Uh, and that model serving layer will get some requests from users or from applications that will respond with some predictions. Now, at the back end of that serverless function that does those uh, predictions, there's also a stream that logs all the activities of, of that model serving uh, function, all the data that arrived, all the data, that, all the responses, the latency, the errors, and so on. And this goes into a real-time uh, monitoring system, which goes to the feature store and gets from the feature store all the statistical information about those features. So there's no need for you to do additional analysis or preparation. All the data needed for the drift analysis is already there. And those real-time stream processing functions that analyze the behavior of the, and the patterns of the model will grab that information and run comparison against the real-time data. Uh, based on that data, they may throw alerts. Those alerts may run a pipeline for retraining models, for changing ensembles, and so on. But also, all the data from production goes back into the feature store automatically. So if you want to do a retraining of a model, uh, the new data, the fresh data is already part in the feature store and could be used for retraining or for examination, examining the behavior of the models uh, in a, and doing a deeper dive into what happened in, in production. And next. So one, one example way of building all of that using uh, the open source tools that we promote like MLRun and Nucleo and others uh, is, you know, the first part is dealing with the ingestion. So let's assume we have an application. That application requires data from three different sources. Some of it is, you know, sort of batch data. Some of it is online data. Like maybe I need to tap into SAP or Oracle to get all the information uh, about the transactions. Maybe external data sources like Nielsen and so on. And, and also maybe I have some interactive mobile applications you know, that collect information from my uh, users and loyalty programs and so on, uh, you know, deals with coupons. And so all those different applications build different feature sets and write, write them into the feature store. Uh, once it's in the feature store, I can just go and take a Jupyter notebook, tap into the feature store and start playing around with the data without necessarily needing to think too much about how to access and bring and digest and analyze uh, this data. Uh, next, star. Now, as, as I define a feature vector, I could just go and run a fully automated pipeline for taking that feature vector, uh, running a training, you know, preparing the data, running training using AutoML tools, whether it's a cloud service or the open source tools, and then deploy the functions, the serverless functions that do the model serving, uh, along with the drift analysis and so on. So. This is a fully automated pipeline that can take the, the features from the feature store, build the model for you, and create the model serving functions. Uh, next. So those model serving function interact in real time with the, the, the feature store, and they, they can fetch and 
and uh, return uh, model data and feature vectors. But also in parallel, they also monitor all the data from those serverless function is monitored and goes back into the feature store. And so we can analyze drift. We can later on do uh, other analysis like explainability and all sorts of legal um, and governance related issues around the, the production data. So this, this is how we can build a full solution in a relatively simple, uh, simple way without too much uh, handholding without too much manual work because this is all done on a single framework. They're integrated with a lot of automation at the back end and essentially serverless uh, computing and so more of a managed service experience. Um, okay, so uh, with that, maybe I'll show a few, uh, just a few things. I'll share my screen. Uh, the, I think you have another poll question, Sar, or? Uh, yeah, we can take that after the after the demo. Okay, so uh, do you see my screen? Yes, we see it. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll try and do it quick, but essentially the, you know, the main framework that we use is ML Run, which is also uh, promoted by, and developed by mainly by Quasio. And this is a sort of more holistic approach where you have the feature store, you have the serverless processing engines and the, the full pipeline anywhere from the ingestion uh, to uh, data to training and model serving and model monitoring. Uh, so the first thing you may want to do, and by the way, it's all it's all, all covered in the documentation, is build the features. So this is where you can just go and define, you know, some feature sets and you know build some pipelines and run them. And this is how you would build those uh, those feature uh, those, this data into the feature store. And then as you want to, to run some uh, training, you can just say, you know what, I need those set of features, build a feature vector for me. And, um, you know, and then I have a feature vector for training. It's as easy as that. I don't need to think about too much analytics and um, I just fetch data from a catalog. You can also do it through a user interface, uh, but can also be done uh, through a notebook. Uh, as you train your model, you may want to go online and, and build a serving. Uh, layer. So here you can just load in the serving function. You can just uh, load this uh, feature vector uh, service. You know, if you want to see the statistics of that feature vector uh, and use it later for things like drift analysis or other things, you can actually see uh, for each feature what are all those uh, things, including histo histogram data and so on. And in order to predict the model, I can just throw in like a key, in this case, it's financial data. So like a ticker, but if it's a customer, then like a customer ID, and then I'll get back the feature vector as a result. So really trivial this way to manage the data for training, for serving and for the model monitor. Now let's assume that I want to train my, my model or create a pipeline, but this time using CI and full automation. I don't want this manual process, you know, working with notebooks and shift enter is nice, but it's not something that you want to do for production. So let's take like GitLab or GitHub or something like that. And you could just build a CI script as part of your CI system, like uh, you know, GitLab CI or GitHub Actions or Circle CI or Jenkins. This is an example of a fully automated pipeline that essentially uh, takes my code, builds a serverless function around it, executes it, you know, take the result of my data preparation, run it through a pre-baked. Uh, classification function, and then take the result of my training, run full testing on it, and then uh, take the result of my testing, and then just uh, import a model serving function and uh, launch it and run the model serving function, essentially deploy the model into production. And maybe I also want to test the model serving function with some dummy data, so I can just build another step. So this pipeline essentially runs my full machine learning pipeline anywhere from gathering and preparing the data, training, testing, creating the model serving functions, testing the model serving function. And as part of that CI, by the way, if you run it, it will actually have native integration with your CI. So as I launch my, my pipeline automatically in an event of a retraining or just changing my code, I would actually see this progressing and reporting back to my CI system so I can track the behavior uh, for later use. I can approve the models based on the metrics of the model and so on. So this is how I can deploy the model. Now, once 
uh, once I ran all those things, they're also, they're not just in the CI, everything is also tracked by ML run. So I, I can see every experiment and so on. And, and also it produced the model. I can just go in and open the model that was created and see all the different, uh, all the different information about that, that model. Okay, now beyond just looking at the model, I can also look at the deployment of the model, the actual model uh, endpoint that is running in real time and collecting data. So I can look into the drift analysis using three different uh, algorithms um, and also do the real time feature analysis with the expected and actual uh, values of the, of the drift analysis. And also if I prefer something like a dashboard like Grafana, because it's all open source, all very well integrated with different frameworks. Uh, this is by the way, I'm serving an ensemble so I can see each individual model in ensemble. And I could actually, this is like the Iris data set. So I can see for every feature, uh, expected values, behaviors, real time values, all those features, custom matrix that I can build into my serving and so on. So the entire pipeline, anywhere from uh, taking the data, doing preparation using uh, an integrated feature store, uh, then running automated training and you know deployment pipelines using CI tools, uh, and then managing and tracking the experiments and, and all their you know, individual runs and results and uh, mon monitoring the models and, and all their metadata, all the way up to monitoring the, the, the data in production and the model behavior and so on. So all of that is done relatively without a lot of coding uh, in a very, very automated way, which is designed for production. So everything that we've seen here is auto scaling, is auto healing uh, and so on. And so with that, I end uh, my part. Excellent, thanks, Yohan. We have some great questions in the panel already. So let's just go through a couple of them. Okay, the first one is around uh, data. So what types of data do companies usually take into account to create accurate trade promotions? Uh, I can take that. Um, so typically we are looking at uh, ERP data uh, because a lot of transactional data past uh, sales data is a major factor. Uh, we've seen some external data getting used. Uh, this could be uh, data from third party sources like uh, Nielsen, IRI, et cetera. Uh, there are other uh, data sources, say um, external weather data, or uh, if you've run some promotions outside, uh, maybe some kind of coupons that would be part of uh, the artifact offering uh, coming out of this package, uh, the trade promotion program itself, right? So these are some uh, different kinds of data sets that we've seen in our implementations of trade promotions for CPG customers. Excellent, thank you. And another question, this one came in, your own as you were uh, doing the demo. Uh, this is great. I'm currently working on integrating validations into the model deployment pipeline. Do you have recommendations on documentation or reading material on best practices around that? Yes, yeah, so as you've seen in the pipeline I was showing that there's actually a validation process. There are two different types of validations. Uh, one is validating the model accuracy at the training site, you know, essentially keeping aside some, uh, some testing data, running it in, against the model, verifying its, uh, its accuracy. Uh, the other set of testing is more around uh, the model behavior in sort of production, things like measuring the, the performance and latency of our serving functions, um, you know, me measuring that, you know, they can actually sustain a certain load, uh, uh, looking at the correctness of the result as part of the full pipeline, not just the, you know, the model produced by scikit-learn. Sometimes the problems are in the data engineering. Sometimes the problems are, you know, in your uh, API uh, that you expose, uh, or the integration between the application and the model. So you need a way to test the entire application. And as you've seen, what uh, what we were sort of uh, looking at is a a way to integrate it with this traditional software development tools like with CI, CD pipelines, uh, with Kubernetes, with sort of, uh, you know, SDKs and so on. That's great. Thanks, Johan. Another question here. Uh, in your experience, once the model drift has been identified, how long did it take for you to act on it in the field? 
Sagar, do you maybe want to take this one? Yeah, I'll take that. I think it depends if it's e-commerce or brick and mortar. E-commerce, uh, you're able to act on the field, you know, with a short turnaround, maybe over two to four days. Brick and mortar, uh, you know, depending on the kind of tactics you want to implement in the field, anywhere between two weeks to four weeks it'll take. Yeah, maybe I, I can also take it. Uh, in some cases, you can actually do handle it automatically using automation. Uh, for example, we may have a model that was trained on a week uh, worth of data or uh, trained on a season and things like that. And maybe we can combine different models, some models that are trained are more uh, on more generic data and some on more specific data. And we can create an ensemble. And at a certain point, maybe we identify that the more specific models misbehave. And uh, you've seen in the model monitoring that I actually the single model was comprised of four different uh, individual models that are forming the ensemble. So I can monitor the ensemble level uh, and see the total value of the total accuracy of the model. But I can actually see that maybe one leg of the stool, you know, one uh, model that comprise that uh, builds the ensemble has much better performance than the others. And that's maybe because it was trained on like um, something which is non-seasonal or vice versa. Uh, maybe uh, some models are specific to a group of users and some models are more generic. And I, I can see that uh, certain models work better. So I can just switch in real time. I can essentially send the serving uh, pipeline instructions to change the weighting function and start be behaving better. And that could save lots of money if you don't have to wait a couple of weeks for your models to, to get uh, ready. Another thing that I mentioned is because of the way that we work, that essentially feeding all the data back into the feature store, you can essentially retrain immediately. So that means that you can save again lots of days. Excellent. Uh, so we are nearing the end of our time. We're going to need to stop with the questions here. I just wanted to mention that there are plenty more resources on bringing data science to production on the Iguazio website. On our MLOps page, you can find previous sessions of this webinar series and blogs, videos, and other resources to help you on your path to production. And in these resources, industry experts share their experience in operationalizing machine learning. So feel free to check them out and let us know what you think. Okay, great. And with that, I'd like to invite you again to continue the conversation with us in our MLOps Live community. We'll go ahead and share that link again. And at this point, I'd like to thank you so much, Pavan, Sagar, and Yaron, for this in-depth deep, uh, deep dive into MLOps for CPG companies. And thank you, everyone, for joining. I hope to see you next time. <laughs>